Hey everyone, welcome to my channel, Dr. Gass's Adventures, a channel where I combine uh, topics in anesthesiology as well as things I like to do outdoors. Today the topic is on Rotem. Rotem can be a pretty daunting topic and hopefully we can go over the basics so that when you get a picture back that looks like this, then you know what products you can order. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to the University of Utah where I did my anesthesiology training, great training. Uh, if you're still a medical student, then highly recommend it if you're looking to go into the anesthesiology field. And another big shout out to Dr. Nate Bergenheyer. He's the Rotem master over at the University of Utah and taught us everything that we know. Okay, so let's get started. So we're going to kind of go over four different things. The first thing that we're going to do is the measurement on Rotem, what it equals in TEG, what that means and how to treat it. The second thing we're going to talk about is the different assays, the Intem and Extem families on Rotem. Uh, the different parts of both of those and how to interpret those with some pictures. The third thing that we're going to talk about is how to determine if you need to get platelets versus cryo. Um, one of the things on Rotem that's helpful is the A10 level. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is why you can't see the effects of things like Plavix, Plavix aspirin, um, and other uh, medications that you take orally. So the first thing is clot time on Rotem. That equals the R value on TEG. And that is the time that will take thrombin generation. And the treatment is FFP, typically 10 to 15 mils per kilogram. So the next, next measurements on Rotem are kind of a combination, the clot formation time, the alpha angle, and the A10 number. That equals the K value on TEG. And that is the clot propagation time. And like we're going to talk about on the third theme, this is either platelets or cryo. And we'll discuss this a little bit later on how you decide which one or both. Next level is MCF. That equals the MA. That is equal to the clot strength. And if that number is low, then you want to give platelets. Then the next one is the ML. That is equal to your lysis 30. And that tells us if we have too much clot lysis. And the treatment is antifibrinolytics. Typically, we will give two different kinds. We'll either give TXA or aminocaproic acid. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to talk about are the two different assays for Rotem. And there's two different families, the Intem family and the Extem family. So the two in the Intem family is Intem and Heptem. And the three in the Extem family are the Extem, the Fibtem, and the Aptem. And these are all different things that you can ask your anesthesiology assistant or um, text to, to run on the Rotem. Okay, so we have the basic definitions down and the different type of assays. So let's go back to the original image that I showed. And as you can see, there are four different boxes. There's the Xtem, the Intem, the Fibtem, and the Aptem. So we have the Intem family there and then three of the Xtem. And as you can see, it doesn't really look normal. So the first thing we're gonna look at is clotting time. And a normal clotting time is less than 80 seconds. So if we take a look at the image, we can see that both in the XTEM and in the INTEM, the clotting time is in the 50 second range. So this indicates that we don't need any FFP for this particular patient. So the next thing that we look at is the clot formation time. A normal clot formation time is between 46 and 148 seconds. And the nice thing with Rotem actually is that when you get the print out of the paper, all the number, numbers that are abnormal will be in red. You still have to look at the image and all the numbers taken together, but it'll kind of help you um, determine what, what numbers you need to really focus on. But normal clot formation time is 46 to 148. And if we take a look at this patient again, then we can see that it's both XTEM and INTEM is well above that range. So this tells us that we need either platelets or we need cryo, and that's kind of where the A10 then comes in play. So to get an accurate uh, number for A10, you want to look at the FibTem, and in this patient, the A10 level is at 15. Now, you have to know if your patient is hemorrhaging or not hemorrhaging, um, should be pretty obvious, but if your patient is not bleeding and the A10 is 9 or greater, then you don't need to give any cryo. It means that you're not fibrinogen deficient. But if your patient is bleeding, then you want your number to be 18 or greater. So for this patient, let's say that uh, we're not bleeding, then it would be sufficient and we would know that we would need to get platelets. Uh, a good trick 
um, and rule of thumb is that your A10 will increase uh, two millimeters for every one gram of fibrinogen. And in five units of cryo, that is one gram. So if this patient was bleeding and we we're at 15, we'd want to give at least 10 units to increase that to, to greater than 18. Okay, so the next thing we're going to discuss is if your intem looks like this. So if you're in a bypass room and this is the intem that you get back, it makes it easy because you probably know that you're still on bypass and, and you have heparin in the system. But you may get a patient where they're a trauma patient and you don't know if they're on heparin or not. So the, the, the way you can tell is, is that you need to run another assay. And that is part of the intem family. You need to run a heptem. And it has heparinase. And that will break up the heparin. And so if your intem then corrects itself when you run the heptem, you know that the heparin is the cause for the prolonged clotting time. If it does not correct it, then you do indeed need to give factor. All right, so then if everyone remembers, the last thing that's on the Rotem is the lysis or the ML. And so let's say you get x back and it looks like this, then you probably need to give some TXA or aminocoproic acid. You can double check with your Aptem, make sure the Aptem is normal. And if so, then give one of those because it means that you're having too much clot lysis. So the bonus topic that I mentioned earlier is topic number four. And that is on why aspirin and Plavix and Xarelto don't show up on Rotem. One of the biggest questions that Dr. Bergenheyer gets from trauma surgeons or from anesthesiologists that aren't super familiar with Rotem is they have a patient comes in and they're on aspirin or Plavix or Xarelto and they run a Rotem and it's completely normal. So if we kind of take a zoomed out picture, um, then clot propagation we have the fibrinogen, which is the connector between the glycoprotein 2B and 3A. And that's essentially what Rotem is, is really looking at. Is that intact or not? Okay, so if we zoom in on the clot propagation, this is what we see. And if we remember aspirin, it inhibits COX-1, which eventually inhibits thromboxane A2, which is another way um, for you to inhibit your clotting. But that's not detected by Rotem. Um, then you have your Plavix, which inhibits the P2Y12 uh, receptor, which is another way that you can inhibit uh, your clot formation, but um, isn't also, is also not detected by your Rotem. And then you also have your uh, von Willebrand's factor as well. If someone has a von Willebrand factor deficiency, uh, that also isn't going to be detected by Rotem. So there's different methods uh, or your blood to be unable to clot, but isn't detected by Rotem. And the interesting thing is in, in the UK, they actually do have different assays that uh, can detect some of these things. And we're hoping that they do come to America sooner rather than later. So that's Rotem Simplified. I hope you found this video to be useful and helpful for you. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to my channel below. And if you haven't already, go over to the other videos and check out some of my mountain biking adventures.